Hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Brie Hogan. I'm the sales manager of Powell City of Books here in Portland, Oregon. Tonight, we welcome Colonel Terry Verts in conversation with Dr. Katie Mack. Terry Verts is one of only four astronauts in history to have piloted a space shuttle, flown a Russian Soyuz spacecraft, performed spacewalks, and commanded the ISS. He has penned a book for anyone who wants to know what space travel is really like. Colonel Vert's book is How to Astronaut, Everything You Need to Know Before Leaving Earth. It's a wildly entertaining account of the rules, lessons, procedures, and experiences of space travel. Before we begin our event, I do have a few housekeeping notes for the audience. Today's event starts with a conversation between Colonel Vert and Dr. Mack. Then we will follow that up with a question and answer period. If you have a question for either Terry or Katie, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit those questions. We will be recording tonight's event and we'll post it on our YouTube channel next week. I will post the link to our YouTube channel in the chat function. And you can support Colonel Ver and Powell's books by purchasing a copy of How to Astronaut. I will post the link to purchase that book at the chat function as well. As always, you can keep up with Powell's at powells.com and on our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Tonight, we are very happy to host Colonel Terry Vert. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics from the United States Air Force Academy in 1989 and a Master of Aeronautical Science degree in aeronautics from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Selected by NASA in 2000, he was the pilot of the STS-130 mission aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour. In March of 2015, Verts assumed command of the International Space Station and spent over 200 days on it. Burtz is one of the stars and photographers of the IMAX film, A Beautiful Planet, released in April of 2016. He was also the author of A View from Above, and he lives near Houston. Joining him tonight is Dr. Katie Mack. Dr. Mack is the author of the book, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking. The End of Everything is an accessible and eye-opening look at the five ways the universe could end and the mind-blowing lessons each scenario reveals about the most important cause the most important concepts in cosmology. Mac is a theoretical astrophysicist, exploring a range of questions in cosmology, the study of the universe from the beginning to end. She is currently an assistant professor of physics at North Carolina State University, where she is also a member of the Leadership in Public Science Cluster. She has been published in numerous publications such as Scientific American, Slate, Sky and Telescope, Time and Cosmos Magazine, where she is a columnist. Terry and Katie, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to host you here at Powell's Books. Thanks, Thanks so for, much having, for us. having us. Yeah, this is great. So, um, so I think that the, the what, what we should start with is um, your slideshow because I think everybody needs to be primed with some amazing images of of Earth and space and and so on. So, okay, you said you well, had something ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll jump into it. I've got a. Um, little presentation about the book just to talk about it and what, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what, um, what it's all about. And the reason I wrote How to Astronaut was to take the experience of spaceflight and make it accessible for everybody. Um, what I didn't want to do is write another astronaut memoir because there's a million of those and that story has been told. Um, and I didn't want to make a really technical book that's only for, I wanted to make something that you know, it would be for anybody. It's for old people and young people, for men and women. Um, you, you don't need any type of sp special space training. And NASA has a lot of acronyms, as you know. And uh, so I use all of them and I make fun of all of them. So I'll say, for example, when I was, wor I was working out on ARED in parentheses with an acronym for workout machine or what I, I try and take, you know, the space terminology and make it, um, make it fun and accessible. And I really had two goals when I wrote the book. I wanted, to, I wanted people to laugh and say, wow. So those are kind of the two goals. And I, and I wrote it in a short chapter or really essay format. So there's 51 of these short chapters or essays about all aspects about space travel. So some of them are things you'd expect. Um, and some of them are, are subjects that you might not expect. So I've got a few examples here of that. Um, so I start off with launch, 
This is my first launch on STS-130 on the Space Shuttle Endeavor. And of course, you'd expect that, right? Because every astronaut book has launch. That's how you start off. But there's a few chapters there. Um, just how to get in the spacesuit is a, quite a problem. <laughs> and so that has its own chapter. What it's like during launch, the sound and the vibration and the acceleration. Um, there's a chapter about the red button that you'll have to read, but there's a guy who's got a red button there at the, at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. And um, there's kind of a funny story about how I learned that it existed and what it did. Um, so launch is something that you'd probably expect. And um, so it was spacewalking. So there's a whole section on spacewalking, um, what it's like to be outside, what it's like to put that big spacesuit on. It's a big, bulky, 150 kilogram, you know, hundreds of pounds uh, spacesuit that's pressurized, which means it's really hard to move in. Um, and it's super uncomfortable and it's just, it's an amazing thing. And it's basically a spaceship. So you have communication, you have oxygen and cooling and carbon dioxide removal and communication. And, and if you see my backpack, those little black dots are actually little rocket jets that can fly you around. So it's like putting on your, your spacesuit. And, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, I was really busy outside. I, you know, I didn't have time to take pictures. I didn't have time for anything. I was plugging in cables and putting grease on bolts were my two jobs during my three spacewalks. And then every once in a while I'd stop and I'd turn around and look and it felt like I was seeing something that humans weren't meant to see. Like I, this is God's view of the universe. This, I was seeing creation. It was this profound moment. And then I had to get back to work because I had to go plug in a cable. So <laughs> the description of like what it's like outside was, was pretty interesting. What it's like to have this thin piece of plastic in your visor and on the other side of that is instant death. Um, my favorite thing I did in space, and we can talk about this later, probably the most important thing I did also, with the possible exception of AMS, we can talk about AMS. Um, definitely. Is... <laughs> is uh, it was filming an IMAX movie called A Beautiful Planet. So it was um, my, my dream come true. As a kid, I saw a movie called To Fly at the Air and Space Museum, and I was hooked, you know, and I, I wasn't planning on it. No one planned on it, but I'm definitely a photography guy. You know, some people are camera people, some people are not, and I'm definitely a camera person. So just by the luck of the draw, I got assigned to a mission where we were making an IMAX movie. And Katie, you and I met, one of the many times we've met or several times we've met, but at mm -hmm. a film festival and, and it was dedicated yeah. to Tony Myers, who was my director or Tony was there actually. So Tony was, yeah. you know, part of this movie. Unfortunately, she passed away just months after that because she had cancer. Um, but she was really my mentor. And I just directed another movie that we can talk about. And Tony taught me how to do that. Like she was, she taught me how to be a director. So she was amazing and getting to take pictures of the earth was amazing. And this cupola is amazing. And we can talk about that. I got to install this yeah. module where I'm at on my first shuttle flight, which is pretty awesome. Um, the beauty of being an astronaut is that it's not always the same thing. And I have ADD and I just like you're a PhD. So you really focused on something for years and years and years and years. And I don't mm -hmm. think I could ever have that focus because <laughs> I like to do different stuff. So one of the things we got to do was medical training. So I, I got to go to the hospital here in Houston and I spent a week in the emergency room learning how to do stitch. Well, I learned how to do stitches before I went there. And while we were in the hospital, I was actually, you know, I stitched up a guy whose pit bull had taken a giant bite out of his arm and people had car accidents and burn victims at the chemical plants here. And there was all kinds of doom, but as a medical trainee, in an ironic kind of way, it was actually really good. It was really interesting. So um, I kind of fell in love with it. In fact, afterwards, I went to the local bookstore and I got an MCAT study guide, which is the test you have to take to be a doctor. And mm -hmm. I flipped through it for about five minutes and then put it back on the shelf and said, yeah, this is not going to happen. <laughs> Maybe in my 20s, um, but not in my 40s. Uh, survival training is something you might not expect astronauts have to do, but um, as a fighter pilot, I had to do it so that if I ejected over enemy territory or ended up as a prisoner of war, you know, you'd, you'd do that. So I did survival training with the U.S. Air Force. I did it again with the U.S. Navy when I got to NASA. I did it with the French Air Force when I did an exchange with the French Air Force. Um, it was actually with the French Army. And then I did it with the Russians, uh, with basically the Russian Air Force for winter survival training and also water training 
survival training. And then I did it with NASA again with an organization called Knowles um, on this kayaking trip in Alaska. So I, every time I do it, I'm like, God, I hope this is the last time. And then I end up doing it again. So, um, but those are pretty amazing experiences. And I wrote, this chapter was by far my longest. We had to cut it in half because I had written, I remembered so many stories of, uh, of survival stuff. Um, uh, there's a chapter on flying and flying. And I know you're going through, we can talk about your flying. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love these pictures you sent me. I haven't flown for <laughs> several years now, but uh, it's the most important skill that astronauts have as far as training goes, because all the simulators are great, but you're not doing a simulator when you're in the real world. Like if you mess up, you, you might die. And, and that's true in a jet. Um, so you, it's really good to get experience doing things that are actual risk to your pink body and mm -hmm. flying jets is one of those things. Also, you have to have something that we call situational awareness, which is just keeping track of everything that's going on, staying a few steps of the jet. And if the jet's going 500 knots, you really have to be thinking ahead of things. Um, and so even though the stick and rudder skills of how to land a T-38 don't matter in space, the mental skills of, you know, staying calm under pressure and keeping situational awareness are really important. They're the most important astronaut skills. Um, one of the cool things, my first book was a Nat Geo photography book. Uh, and I, I wrote about seeing, getting to know the earth by color. And that was surprising. I didn't expect that. Lots about space flight, as you see in How an Astronaut was surprising. But I got to know, you know, Russia and Canada are white. Um, the Bahamas and the Caribbean are just spectacular. This, the, a lot of the oceans are pretty, but that blue and turquoise is so big. There's so much of it there. It, it really stands out. Um, Australia, I tell a story about the first time we opened the window shutters to the cupola, the inside of the station turned red and it turned out we were over Australia and that was really kind of blew me away. Um, the Congo in Africa is super dark. I mean, it, it's almost black. The jungle is so dark in Central Africa. Um, it's amazing. And you can't see the rivers unless the sun is reflecting. So I tell a lot of stories about, um, about those places. And uh, the, another color, this is the Aurora uh, uh, Australis in the Southern Hemisphere, but um, there's nothing like it that I've ever seen. It's this alien, show that again, this alien green, red plasma. It's just amazing. Um, uh, indication of the Earth's magnetic field. So the colors of Earth are pretty spectacular. Um, another unexpected chapter that would fall under that category was cutting Samantha's hair, who is um, an Italian astronaut. So I flew with Anton, who's a Russian, and Samantha's an Italian. But not only that, she's also the most famous Italian in the world. She was the first ever Italian woman astronaut. Um, and lots of women fly in space and they usually just let their hair grow out that, you know, they do a ponytail or whatever, and you have to do something with it. Otherwise it's this giant porcupine thing. Um, but you know, they don't go through the trouble of getting a proper hairstyling, but Samantha did. And so that it was the most stressful thing I did while I was in space by far. Uh, I went to our hairdresser here in Houston for two and a half hours and learned how to do women's hair. So. I'm kind of eyeing your hair right now, Katie. I'm wondering how, where, where I'd put the clips and, you know, mm -hmm. how I do the, the layering and stuff. So anyway, of all the skills I thought I'd, of all the stuff I'd have to do is when I sign up to be an F-16 pilot, learning women's hairstyling was not one of them, but it was, it was pretty cool. She seemed happy, you know, and we did it twice. And Anton was important. This is a three-person job because he had to hold the vacuum cleaner. So I'd cut, the hair would go shooting off, and he'd suck it up with the vacuum cleaner. So it was a... It was quite a production. But uh, so anyway, those are just like nine of samples from the chapters to give you an idea of what the book's about. Yeah, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I, I found while, while reading the book was, first of all, um, you know, as, as you, you sort of alluded to, the, the kinds of different things you had to learn, uh, the kinds of different skills that you, that you mm -hmm. used um, were, were just astonishingly varied. And, and you know, I, I sort of chuckled when you talked about, uh, you know, uh, not being able to focus on one, one thing. And it seems like yeah. that must be actually a, an asset as, as an astronaut because you, 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 know, you have to learn survival and flying jets and doing medicine and cutting hair. <laughs> Like yeah. just this such a huge range of um of of skills um 
And I also, the other, my other big reaction to reading the book was that it made it very, very difficult to be stuck on earth and not <laughs> up there myself and not, uh, not out there flying, flying fighter jets or being in space or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, well, hopefully someday soon you'll be up there. You should, you should be up hopefully. there. But the, the point about lots of different things is exactly right. So, you know, you're a PhD and the, by definition, mm -hmm. you are the world's expert on the smallest little, like one question, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, lot, you know, lots <laughs> about lots, but that sure, by sure. PhD, that's, that's what a yeah. PhD is. You get really smart yeah. about one thing. And yeah. I, every once in a while, there'll be an astronaut who flies and they have a PhD in what biology and, and the experiments here. And that's great, but that's like 45 minutes of their six month mission. Right. And the other 5.99 months are m fixing equipment and doing spacewalks and doing press events like this and mm -hmm. doing, I had 250 experiments. So the other 249 experiments are not PhDs. And so an astronaut has to get really good at being decent quickly. Like you have to be, mm -hmm. you're basically like a lab tech, you know, right, um, right. you're not a brain surgeon, but you have to be able to do stitches. And if you have to be able to do something that somebody tells you how to do it. I'm no astronomer. Checklists and right, you have to be able to like be decently competent at everything, because mm -hmm. one day we'll be Star Trek and there'll be a hundred people and you can have specialists, but right now there's just a few few people and there are no mm -hmm. specialists. Everybody has to do everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so can can you just say a little bit more about like the preparation? Like so, you you mentioned a bit how fighting, uh, flying jets was was good preparation because it allows you to have that practice of doing something complicated that could kill you. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I've heard that from a few astronauts that it's it's useful to get experience in things like like scuba diving or mountaineering or yeah. flying complicated things um, specifically because it's complicated and can kill you. Um, what I mean. Is there, were there other things that, that uh, in your, you know, in, in your studies at the Air Force Academy or like, like what, what are the other things that, that allowed you, to, that really were assets when you were, when you were out there? You know, honestly, Katie, I think there was, the reason I got picked, there were a lot of good fighter pilots and test pilots and they were smarter than me and better looking than me. But I had done an exchange in France and I spoke French. So I had like an international ability and experience and I spoke foreign languages and you got to learn Russian. And right. I, that really set me apart from other hmm. folks. And so um, it's good to have something that sets you apart, especially that, but you're, you're, I, you know, flying jets or, or Pipers or Cessnas is really important. Um, my, the last thing I did a couple of years ago before I left, there was a new class of astronauts who were hiring them and I, went through all the pilots and then I went through that there was only a couple hundred pilot applicants. There was like 8,000 engineer applicants. So then I was helping the engineers go through the engineering applicants and every single engineer, they all know Python. They all know HTML. They were all mm -hmm. senior engineer for this project. Everybody was the same thing, but there was this one woman who had been like a NASCAR mechanic. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I remember that to this day. I was like, wow, that's cool. Let's yeah. look at this some more, you know? And right. so you need something that will get you in the, it's not going to get you hired for sure, but at least you get looked at some more rather than thrown in the massive stack of thousands of other things. Um, right. So things right. like that really stand out, something that sets you apart and also shows that you can do more than one thing. You have to be right. able to walk and chew gum as an astronaut, so. Right, right. Or, or float. <laughs> float and chew gum, exactly. <laughs> the except for there's me. no gum in space. Float and eat M&Ms, except for they're not M&Ms, they're candy coated chocolates because NASA doesn't want to like <laughs> promote right. M&Ms. <laughs> um, I mean, speaking of, of doing a variety of things in space, um, what, what was it like becoming a, you know, a, a cinematographer up there? What was yeah. the filming like? That was the most awesome part of my mission. And, and in fact, I didn't, NASA gave me one hour on my official schedule to, it was called like equipment fam familiarization. Um, where I could sit down and get all the cameras that I'd learned and just get used to using them. Other than that, the whole movie was filmed in my spare time, in my crewmate's spare time. I wasn't the only guy that filmed it too. Um, but uh, it, it was really, really fun and I loved it. And I had a relationship with Tony, the director, and also Jim Nyhouse was my director of photography. 
And when I did One More Orbit, the movie that just came out two days ago, um, I asked Jim to be my director of photography again, because he's really good. So I would call him at random times and go, hey, I'm trying to get an Aurora shot and, you know, we're using ISO at 10,000, but should we do frame rate at two or one? Or, you know, we would just have these conversations about the technical filming stuff. And with Tony, she had a giant uh, a scene list, a shot list. Like I want, I think there was 300 shots she wanted. Um, and so I'm like, Tony, I can't, my brain is not big enough. So give me 10. So she would, mm -hmm. she constantly updated like her top 10. And then I could go through those and, and try and prioritize those. So we, I had a constant dialogue back and forth with both. And we weren't supposed to. We were supposed to go through the payload center, through the NASA chain of command, blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, forget this. I, I got to film a movie and I don't have any spare time. I got like one minute. So I got to, I would just call them directly. And, and that worked. That was, it worked really well. And um, it, it was so nice to hear from Tony. She was always very positive and like some stuff I would shoot and it was not a good thing. And she was like, Terry, that was great. But can you try this the next time? And I knew what she meant. But there was a few shots that I just came up with, I thought on my own, um, that she was like so happy. It was really cool to see, to make your director happy. That was really cool. Mm. And uh, like there's a Santa scene. I don't know if you've seen A Beautiful Planet. You need to see it. Uh, yeah, I think um, I saw it as part of that film festival that we were both at. Yeah, right. That's right. They had, that's what we were there showing it. So yep. the Santa Claus scene I, I thought of Christmas Eve and I went down and I filmed this thing. Um, there's a scene of Samantha and the cupola that it's not that great it's just the camera moving in to show samantha but the mm -hmm. the lighting and the exposure was so difficult um that was like one i'm really proud of that no one else is probably going all the camera nerds of the world will be like wow but no one else is going to notice it but so anyway i loved i loved doing it and real quick so when i left nasa a couple years ago you know what do you do when you grow up and i could go to you know boeing or lockheed or or teach or whatever and that's what most astronauts do and those are those things are great but it's not me and um i want to make a difference in the world so do you go into politics and then their only goal is to beat up on the other party and raise money for their party and that i don't know for me the way to make an make an impact was to to write books like your book here um and do film and tv because i think through storytelling through mm. books and tv shows and films that's how you impact people so that's that's kind of why I chose that career path. So, so uh, you have you have another movie out. You you briefly mm -hmm. alluded to it. Um, one more orbit. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so a couple of years ago, I met this friend at uh, the Apollo Gala, Hamish Harding, and he had this crazy idea to to fly some Apollo astronauts around the world, and we would call it One More Orbit. And we would set a world record doing it, and it would just be you know in honor of a, Apollo. Um, well, that went on for a couple of years. And finally, last year, Hamish, like a couple months beforehand, is like, Terry, we're going to do this. And I said, yeah, sure. No, Terry, we're really going to do this. And so at that point, I was going to be a pilot on this mission, but I didn't have time to do the train. It's a month-long training program at, at Gulfstream. So he said, why don't you make a movie? And I was like, this is what I want to do in life. I mean, it was a, it was a dream come true. And I, and I had a real budget. like a, It was a real movie. Um, so I had this amazing opportunity. Most people who want to be directors don't get that opportunity. And so the challenge was, um, we're going to fly around the planet, but I couldn't get any talent. I actually asked George Clooney if he would do it and he was busy filming a movie. And anyway, I asked some, several big names and everybody was busy and it was happening in weeks. So like I was the talent. So that's, mm. you know, one, one strike against it. And then how do you make just flying in a business jet interesting? So that was the other aspect. So I came up with a story that there's the drama, are they gonna set the world record? And the flight over Antarctica was frankly dangerous. I mean, it was really, really long. In order to get the world record, you had to fly directly over the North and South Pole for this particular record. And that's a long flight. And it was the winter time in Antarctica. There's no divert airfields mm -hmm. for thousands of miles. Um, you know, it was pitch black, it was July. So it was, it was black for 20 hours, I think, as we were flying. So anyway, um, so there's the drama, but the real point of the film is how exploration brings people together. Just like Apollo kind of brought the world together during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. We had, there were 10 different people from 10 different countries on the airplane. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was this people from different cultures working together. There's an aspect of climate change. So I kind of put a couple of different stories in the film. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, that, that was another thing I wanted to ask about actually is you, you mentioned a little bit in the book about the overview effect. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and you talk about how, you know, having that different perspective changes how you think about, uh, humanity and, um, mm -hmm. and, and connectedness. D was there also like, did it change how you thought about the environment and um, mm -hmm. like how we're, yeah, how we live on this planet? Can you say more about that? Yeah, I think for some people, they're just, they are who they are. They fly in space and they want to go do it again and whatever. And then for me though, I, you know, I was contemplative about it and I thought about it and I personally, I hope, and I think it made me less of a black and white guy. I was very black and white beforehand and I'm a lot more shades of gray, um, mm -hmm. I can see both sides of most issues. Some issues are black and white and they're mm -hmm. wrong is wrong, but a lot of things are not. A lot of things are black and white and our country needs that right now. But um, the environment was really important because you look down and first of all, you're in space and there's earth over there. So that there's earth over there is not something you normally say, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. that was pretty profound. And it's beautiful. The name of our movie is Beautiful Planet. It really is a beautiful planet. The two environmental problems that I saw and that I talk about when I do my speaking, pollution, especially in China, China is this brown, smoggy soup of pollution. Um, and India, India was pretty smoggy too, but India is also a jungle country, mm -hmm. but it was not all humidity. It was also some pollution. Other than that, I never really saw pollution. I mean, it's there, of course, there's carbon in the atmosphere, but you can't, I couldn't see it with my eyes. But the other environmental impact was deforestation um, that you could see in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. Usually it's white because there's thunderstorms, but on the non-cloudy days, you could see these big giant squares that had been cut out. And Madagascar is this brown island with a little green strip. It used to be a green island. And back in the 1950s mm -hmm. and the 60s, they cut down the trees. And although climate change is bad and we need to fix it, it's going to fix itself. That's not forever. And you have the ultimate long-term perspective, right? We're going to run out of dinosaurs here in the next century or a couple centuries. And, you know, in a matter of centuries, the carbon will be gone. But when you have species loss, that's forever. And that's mm -hmm. the, when you look at all the environmental problems for me personally, I think the species loss is the one thing that we ain't fixing that. So we got to, you know, that's of all the problems we have, that's one that really sticks out. And the other thing is, um, you know, you look at Mars, you look at Venus, all the other planets, we're never going to live there. You, you can live there in a spaceship or a spacesuit, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we're never going to terraform Mars like some people say we are because there's no magnetic field. Yeah. 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 And no, I, you, I, I, I talk about this a lot. Like if we, right. if we go to Mars, no we're living B. in caves underground. Right. There's no um, plan B. There's only, yeah. so we ought to keep, take care of earth is that's the, the yeah. point I'm getting to. And, and I mean, of course, you know, species loss and all that, that's tied up with all the climate change as well. It is, right. right. Like it's all, this is all connected. And then right. deforestation is a lot of times for crops that, that also contribute right. to climate change. Like everything is, is well, part of the same picture. Cows, right? They, yeah. it's not crops. Yeah. It's, it's for, it's for. Well, it's crops to feed the cows and then right, also exactly. the cows. Right. <laughs> yeah, like there's a whole and, thing. <laughs> and plastic. I'm actually working yeah. with a, with a graphene company that's figured out how to make, how to really dramatically help the plastic problem. So I'm super excited about that, hopefully. That's great. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned it and I, I have to ask you about AMS02. Um, AMS, the- Oh, yes. Yes. The, uh, the experiment, um, because, because there, there are two things I, I know about that you, that you, uh, that you did up there have to, having to do with science. One of them is putting in the cupola, which is, you know, that's very important. The other one is that you had, you had something to do with the AMS experiment. And as a dark matter <laughs> physicist, uh, this is very important to me. So can you say a little bit about that? Yes. So AMS, uh, for those who don't know, is this particle detector. It's on, it's this big, uh, bigger than a refrigerator, 10,000 pound thing out on the side of the space station. And it's just looking for these particles flying in. 
mostly anti-helium. And I'm a fighter pilot describing what you should be describing, but I think that's right, right? <laughs> I, that... can, I can say a little bit about the, the yeah. physics of it. If you, so I, I was actually in Michigan. It was in the blue ficker that was dedicated to AMS and Dr. Ting was in there when they installed it on uh, STS-134. So that was really cool. I just love this stuff. It's my personal thing. Mm -hmm. So this big refrigerator is looking at particles and if they see certain types of particles, they can infer that there are certain types of dark matter. I don't know about dark energy, but anyway, they're trying to figure out what the universe is made of because Katie, mm -hmm. she, you, you might think she's smart, but she doesn't even know what 90% of the universe <laughs> is. So, um, Yeah, but I have that in have common this. with the other 7 billion humans on Earth. So right, I don't feel exactly. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing how fundamentally ignorant we are about the universe. But yeah. um, the, so when I was doing a spacewalk, I was installing antennas and some reflectors for these vehicles to come up and I accidentally kicked AMS and I was like, oh, that's AMS. And so anyway, but it was, um, if it's broken, it wasn't my fault. It was my the other guy who was out there with me. Okay. <laughs> that's my Good story and I'm sticking to it. But <laughs> well, honestly, there was nothing to do. I never, mm -hmm. like it was there, it was plugged in. I didn't have to do, by, I had to keep the station running, which powered mm -hmm. it, which allowed it to collect data. But there were, it wasn't like I was in there turning knobs, trying to, you know, do anything. I, it, it was just there running. But of all the stuff, all the science experiments, there was a few drug for bone and a couple of the big uh, Novartis, you know, drug companies. Those experiments were important, but I think AMS is the most important science we're doing because it's trying to figure out what the universe is made of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, so it's specifically, it, it looks at charged particles, um, cosmic rays. So, uh, electrons, positrons, protons, antiprotons, and antihelium, as you as you said, and yeah. um, depending on how much antimatter you get in this in this experiment, um, uh, you may or may not be seeing signs of dark matter annihilating in in you know the universe. Um, so uh, we right now it's a little unclear. They they do see some really weird stuff, and it might be related to dark matter. It might be related to supernovae and pulsars and a bunch of weird high energy astrophysics uh, that's going on but you know when so I give talks, matter yeah interacts with dark matter no antimatter is it's a kind of regular so so uh, every regular particle has like an antiparticle associated right. with it so there's an electron and then electron is negatively charged and then there's a positron that's positively charged and, mm -hmm. and if those two meet they annihilate and you have the same thing with protons and, and things like that and um, the thing is that if dark matter is out there and dark matter can annihilate with other kinds of dark matter or it's, it, it can be its own antiparticle, which is weird, and then annihilate with itself, then it might produce pairs of matter and antimatter particles, which is what AMS would be looking for. And so uh -huh. when I give talks about dark matter, I, I almost always include a plot from the AMS experiment because um, they see more positrons, more electron antimatter mm -hmm. than should be out there. And it's either some kind of weird high energy astrophysics or it's dark matter doing annihilation. And, uh, and we need to figure out which of those is happening. And they also see these antiprotons and now they're just saying that they see antihelium, which is even weirder. And uh, the antiprotons might also be something to do with dark matter and that's a whole <laughs> other possibility and then um and then the anti-helium is is very confusing so it's um it's it's one of the big sort of questions and it's in, like ghostbusters right when you uh, if you cross your streams you have this <laughs> yeah 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 matter I mean, and antimatter it, it's ghostbusters yeah yeah yeah, yeah basically <laughs> I, I mean it's it's funny because you know what they're really looking for is just anything weird out there that you didn't expect. So you're just, it's something goes bump in the night and it might be dark matter or, or not. But So here's a question for you. And I write, write about in one of my chapters at nighttime, mm -hmm. um, if I close my eyes, I would, sometimes I would see these white flashes that mm -hmm. is galactic cosmic radiation or really high energy radiation coming in from who knows where. What do you know about mm -hmm. that? Well, like what I would usually see it. Every, I think every time I actually looked at a map, I was always over the South Atlantic anomaly, which mm -hmm. is this, you know, the earth has this magnetic field, but it dips down over the South Atlantic anomaly. Yeah. Um, and so if we're flying through that, you get less shielding. The, the South Atlantic anom anomaly is not good. So mm -hmm. um, 
what, what, are, what are these things that are hitting my optic nerve and causing these white flashes? Yeah, so those are cosmic rays. So those are high energy, um, those are they're high energy particles, charged particles coming from space, uh, most likely coming from, uh, well, depending, but they could be coming from uh, jets of particles coming out of the vicinity of supermassive black holes in other galaxies. Uh, so that's one of the ways that we get cosmic rays. We also get them from jets of particles coming out of pulsars. Uh, we, you know, there's there are a few different ways that you can get um, that kind of high energy radiation, and most of the time they would um, they would be stopped by the atmosphere. If you're out there in space, that's that's not happening. And, and no atmosphere. If, yeah, yeah, and they could be they can be redirected by the magnetic field too. And if you if you have, you know. Uh, an anomaly in the magnet field, then you're not going to get that either. The protection, so. yeah. Well, the yeah. first night, it was my fifth night in space. I was falling asleep, and all of a sudden, there was this giant white flash with no noise, which is kind of, whenever you see a flash, there's always noise. And so I woke up, and I, and I immediately thought of the Apollo guys, because I'd heard them reporting that on their way to the moon. And I thought, cool. Ugh. And then like, I was realizing what was happening, because if there's one radiation mm. hitting my optic nerve, there's a yeah. thousand other ones hitting all the rest of the DNA in my body. So it was cool, yeah. sort of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you mentioned, you mentioned in the book about the, the sort of cancer, um, the cancer yeah. risk, right, from, from being up there. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think, you know, and, and as you say in the book, like as we, as we continue to go farther out into the universe, into the solar system, yeah. that's just going to be even more, um, you know, there's going to be even more problem because even in low Earth orbit, you're you're not in the worst of the radiation. Um, but right. as you travel to the Moon or Mars, if, and if you want to hang it's out worse. at the Moon or Mars, you're right. going to be dealing with it all the time. So. Yeah, unless you dig a cave. If you live in a cave, yeah. um, that'll that'll help a lot. But yeah, that, and that would suck to live in a cave. You know, right? I mean, you probably. Yeah, you're probably going to end up like in a lava tube, uh, right. you know, in, and that's, the view's not great. <laughs> right, the view's <laughs> that's not what you're great. out there for. Right, exactly. Um, we're, we only have a couple more minutes uh, before the, the sort of open Q&A uh, starts. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> let me read this. Wanna... This is so amazing. Oh, okay, okay, okay. For those who don't know Katie's book, this is the introduction to it. It's a poem by Robert Frost. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. What an amazing poem to write about the end of the universe. And I'm only, I'm only about halfway through it, but it's, it's pretty amazing. How is the universe gonna end? Uh, so we don't know yet. Um, so the reason I, the reason I bring up that poem is because, uh, that's asking specifically about the end of the world. And we do know the answer to that one. That is definitely fire because right. the sun will get brighter and swell and engulf Mercury and Venus and destroy, you know, burn off the oceans of the earth and, and we will end in fire. But for the entire universe, there are several possibilities. And in the book, I go through five of them, but there's you know, that could collapse on itself, it could continue expanding forever. Um, there could be a sort of quantum bubble of doom that appears at one point <laughs> in the universe and expands out and destroys everything. That's the um, coolest. That is the coolest, that one's called vacuum decay. Uh, yeah. And there are a couple other possibilities, but um, you know, we think it's probably gonna continue expanding, it's probably not gonna collapse, but after, beyond that, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot we don't know and there's a lot that you know, there are only a few sort of real options for how the universe might end, but we are we are getting new kind of clues all the time and, you know, learning about things like dark matter and dark energy, which are these the biggest mysteries in science that may or may not, uh, you know, influence the, the end of the universe. And so, uh, I don't know, I had, I had a lot of fun with the book trying to kind of go through what we, what we know about cosmology right now how, what it says about the future and how we should think about it if the universe is going to end and we have no ultimate future <laughs> in the cosmos. The um, good news is 
that's a few years in the future, but yeah, we've, we've unless, although time. if it's that vacuum decay, that thing could be coming. So yeah, that's, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the loophole, right? So that's, it could be heading our way. One. So yeah. my understanding, tell me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. So something, some big thing happens. And then this vac, this bubble of vacuum, which is nothing starts expanding at the speed of light and it just instantly destroys completely everything. Yeah, so there, yeah, there could be I mean, this thing, this death ray coming at the speed of light that we don't know, and then all of a sudden we're gone. Right. But you wouldn't notice it either because it, it happens at the speed of light. You wouldn't have it's time painless. to process it. Yeah, it's painless. So, <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. No, no, no need to worry about that. Um, so awesome. I, I, we're, we're just about at the end of the, the Q&A time. I did want to ask okay. one, one quick question um, before uh -huh. we open up to all the other questions. Um, which is, you know, I know that a big part of your life is, you know, talking to audiences and giving presentations and, and, and meeting people who, you know, are just amazed at, at where you've been, what you've done. Um, how do you, how do you cope with the role model thing? Like when you meet a child who says, I want to be just like you when I grow up and, right. and like, what, what is, you know, how do you see your role in that? And how do you, how do you, I don't know, how do you deal with that? What do you, what do you say? One of the things, um, first of all, you know, fame is something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And, but being an astronaut is like a good amount of fame because you put on your mm -hmm. blue jacket, you do the thing and everybody's like, Oh, cool. You're an astronaut. And then you, you walk out the door in your shorts and no one has any idea who you are. So you can like, mm -hmm. you can have your moment of fame and then you can go back to being normal. So I, that kind of helps your mental sanity. But people still know you, their, their eyes are still on you, especially here in Houston. I go places and people mm. know me, you know, because they work mm -hmm. at NASA and their mom works at NASA or whatever. So mm. um, as a role model, I, I just try to do what I can to inspire folks and, and, you know, encourage them. And it's amazing. I remember like an adult at a family party told me about the right stuff. So I read that book and it told me how to be an astronaut and here I am. So mm -hmm. I remember that like really small things can mean a lot, especially in a yeah. kid's life. So if you want to encourage them whenever you can and not tear them down, because yeah. they'll remember that forever. And you might have some, just like your physics, right? There might be some thing here that triggers all these events that, you know, last, last a long time in, in, in someone's life. So you try, I, I try and remember that. Um, yeah. I'm a big baseball guy. So there was this guy named Cal Ripken, shortstop for the Orioles. I always mm -hmm. wanted to be shortstop for the Orioles, but you know, there was Cal Ripken was there. And so I, I couldn't make it past him. <laughs> anyway, he was known for signing. He would stay after games for hours, signing autographs. Mm. And mm. Um, he had a family, he had stuff to do. He wanted to go out to dinner with his buddies, but he, he would do that. And I remember one time somebody said, oh, I was trying to get a thing from Cal, but he didn't sign it, blah, blah, blah. And I remember thinking, okay, the man has signed a million autographs in his life given up mm -hmm. years of his life to help give to other people for free. And one time, one guy remembers the one thing. And so you just have to be mindful of that, that, you know, yeah. one little thing can ruin, you know, your reputation, at least in somebody's mind. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think it's time for Q and A. I right? see. Yes. Yes. I'm back um, to ask you all some questions. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of questions that are quite similar, so I'm going to roll them together into one <laughs> question. Uh, so I'll start with a question for you, um, Colonel Burtz. Uh, was there a significant difference in how rigorous survival training was between the various organizations with whom you trained, Air Force, Navy, France, <coughs> Russia? And related to that, what was the most difficult? What came in handy in space? And could all of these trainings possibly be another book? Yes, they could, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and they were all for different purposes. So there's no doubt that my Air Force training was by far the worst and the hardest because A, I was an 18 year old cadet. So you know, no one was trying to be nice to me. And B, they were trying to teach us how to survive if you get shot down. It was in the middle of the Cold War. You know, I went through a prisoner war camp and I was, I escaped actually, I was the one guy who escaped from our group, but um, uh, that was not fun at all. Uh, and then I did it with the French Air Force a couple of years later, the French army, and that wasn't survival training. That was just like, 
who can march the farthest, the fastest. That was like the tough guy training, you know, who, who could survive the just going 20 miles a night. Um, but then after that, you know, I, the other stuff I did was as an astronaut. So they were nice to you by that point, you know, like, cool, you're an astronaut. So there was no hazing, all that stuff was gone. Um, and the Russian stuff was very, they've had Soyuz's land in places where they shouldn't land. And you, and we knew we might have to survive in the, in the snow. I mean, I launched in, in the Russian winter <laughs> at nighttime. So that I knew that that was something I might do. The Knoll stuff in Alaska wasn't, it wasn't necessarily survival training per se. It was, they would put us on these 10 day or two week kayaking trips and then just try and make it as miserable as possible so that like in some way to simulate group dynamics because you're there with your crew, if you're in space and you have these, you're not happy and everybody's cranky and you know, they were just trying to um, help you to deal with interpersonal things when you're not, when you're under stress and stuff like that. So they were all very different. By far my first experience with the Air Force Siri at the Air Force Academy was the worst, but, but it was important. And you know what it did? It, it gave me confidence. Like I, I didn't want to do that. It was terrible. And I did it. And just having put myself through something that was terrible um, yeah. really gave me a lot of confidence. So that was a good thing. I hate ledges. Like I, if I'm in a jet strapped down, I'll do acrobatics all day long, but I hate standing on the ledge of a building. <laughs> And whenever I walk across the walkway or on a mountain or something, I always go to the ledge and I just, and I, and I always look down and I hate it. My heart's beating. And like, I force myself to do it because I hate it. And just to prove to myself, I can do something that I think is hard. Thank you. This is a question for both of you. Um, I'll have Dr. Mack start first. Uh, both of you, your writing is so interesting and entertaining and you have a knack for taking complex scientific jargon and research and making it really accessible to readers. What kind of strategies do you use to translate um, for readers who may not be scientifically experienced? Uh, so for me, I, um, I, I just have a lot of practice in uh, talking about science to people who are not scientists, mostly through things like social media or science writing, where um, I, I'm specifically trying to, um, trying to exp express something in a particular way so that people will be able to digest it. But it's really just, it's pr just practice with figuring out which kinds of metaphors work, which kinds of um, explanations work, what what confuses people and and that's that's mostly through just talking a lot to people who are not scientists and and especially on social media because people will give you immediate feedback if you are too confusing or um, if you hit the wrong tone and um, and I found that to be really really helpful. Do you have anything to add to that Terry? No that's good. <coughs> Katie as I was reading your book um, it struck me like how awful it would be to be a physicist writing a book about physics because physicists are not shy about letting you know when you're wrong about something. So <laughs> I can only imagine the, the, I, you, I'm sure it's hundred percent right, but you know, you gotta, mm -hmm. if you're going to write a book like this, it's gotta be right. So that's a pretty high threat. Yeah. Thing. I, I sent every chapter to at least two other colleagues to fact right. check and, and critique before I put them to the editor. So yeah, it's, Mine, I just kind of wrote right in like a <laughs> colloquial fighter pilot way. And I tried to not get too technical about things. So there's, there's maybe a few technical errors in mine, but um, I, to be honest, that this is just my style, I guess. I'm, I'm not, a, I got C's in English, <laughs> so I'm not, <laughs> you know, I don't use a lot of big words and I, I try and just speak right in a, in a conversational tone. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Terry. Did you take any special personal items with you? I would assume they mean when you left space. And if so, what are they? So um, on the shuttle, we had a pretty good size uh, backpack or, or bigger of personal stuff you could bring in. And you bring pictures of your family and rings and jewelry and stuff like that. On the Soyuz, it was a smaller, it was like a one and a half kilogram thing that was pretty small. 
And it was the same stuff, but only less of it, you know, like a few jewelry items to give to your family and friends and um, a couple of pictures. And I only had one kilogram. So as I was literally getting ready to go out to the Soyuz, they said, hey, you only have one kilogram. Do you have anything left? And I looked at my colleague and I, he had a watch on. We, we have these Omega watches that we fly in space. But um, so my Rus the Russian trainer, the guy who taught me how to fly the Soyuz, looked at me, he took his watch off and he just gave it to me and I stuffed it in the thing and flew it in space for six months. And he had just had a baby. So that was like the gift for his kid was this watch that he literally took off of his wrist in Baikonur. So the, the stuff I had was not anything, you know, out of the ordinary or unexpected. Um, for me, I'm a baseball guy. So I did bring a few different baseball jerseys and um, I was so proud. When you go to the Baltimore Orioles stadium in the front of the Camden Yards, they've got Buck Showalter's manager of the year, a couple of their three World Series trophies, and my Baltimore Orioles jersey with the 43 on it. So that was pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to smash two other questions together. Um, what is your opinion on the privatization of space travel? Has it impacted NASA morale, or is it a benefit as it is providing an infrastructure that wouldn't be there due to lack of funding? Related to that, um, how do you feel about so-called Space Force currently proposed by the administration? The, the first question was about Space Force or Space Tourist? Uh, I think it was uh, just privatization. Pr privatization? Okay. Space travel, yeah. Okay. Do you want to talk about that, Katie, or? No, yeah, this is, this is your area. This is my question, <laughs> okay. Um, so the privatization it can be a good thing. It can be a very good thing. If you look at governments in general, their motive, their motivation is just to get bigger and spend more money and have more people. It's not to get things done as quickly and efficiently and innovatively as you can. So when you look at some, and that American private sector can be really good at that given the right conditions. So I think if NASA can figure out the right way to do private public partnerships, that's the only way. It's not only a nice to have thing, but it's a requirement. It's, it's necessary and, you know, it's not only sufficient, but it's necessary for us to get into space because the government programs take way too long. I could talk about SLS and Orion and some of the programs that NASA has. They've been going on for 15 years and there's really no end in sight for even the first flight. So um, I think the public private partnerships can be can be very good. When you talk about Space Force, I've actually written about this, um, uh, written some op-eds and, and promoted it because we've had a Space Force since the 1960s. Uh, the military has a large space sector. It spends a lot more on space than NASA does. Uh, the DOD budget's roughly twice NASA's budget, plus or, it's hard to say, plus or minus. Um, and so we've had it for a long time. And I think it makes sense to put them all together and have the person in charge of Space Force be a space person and not a pilot from the Air Force or a boat driver from the Navy or an infantryman from the Army, right? Which is how we had it organized before. Just like after World War II, we won World War II with an Army and a Navy. And two years later, we said, you know what? The Air Force is kind of important. Why don't we have a separate Air Force? So nobody really complains about that. It just makes sense. Um, the other part about it, there's also cyber. So the military does what's called multi-domain warfare. There's air, land, and sea, and space, and cyber. There's five different domains. And I think it would make a lot of sense to have a cyber force also, so that the, all the computer hackers in the military, because they're there, um, aren't working for a pilot in the Air Force or an infantryman in the Army. You know, Let those guys be together. So when we have a war, and let's hope that we don't, but if it happens, um, everybody works together. But when you're in peacetime and you're training, it makes sense to have different forces. Also, you know, we just spend way too much money on the military and this massive trillions of dollars of debt that we're incurring now is gonna make that even more critical in the future. So we need to figure out how to be smart. We don't wanna, you know, reduce our capabilities, but we gotta be smarter about it. And so hopefully if we can organize better and smarter, that can help in the amount of money that we spend also. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mack, do you think humans will start colonizing other planets in our lifetime or not? If so, what planet and what is a realistic time frame? Um, well, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier. Um, I, I think that, that, I think we will visit Mars 
I think that'll be very cool to have humans walking around on Mars. Um, I don't know that we are going to live there in any, you know, extended way because it's just, it's just a really hard place to live. Um, and I don't know that it would be necessarily worth the investment in the short term to have permanent habitats um, on, on Mars. Uh, and then, you know, there's also questions of sort of, is it, you know, do we want to uh, be contaminating other planets and, um, you know, do we want to be, uh, you know, sort of changing all these other worlds? And, and there's, there are lots of discussions that we had around that. Um, but uh, I don't know. I think I think I I think it would be cool to go. I would love to go. I I would I would very happily live in a lava lava tube for several months in order to go to Mars and walk around a bit. I'm cool with that myself. But um, but I think that it, it it'll be very hard to to live there long term, um, because because of the the harsh environment. I but I I don't know. I think I think it, it's not unlikely in the next couple decades that we will have um, some some habitats there. I think that that could happen. I just don't think it's going to be like a large number of people. Uh, Terry, there's a couple of, I guess, more fun questions about the experience of being in space. Um, one of them is what, um, what was your favorite space food? <laughs> <laughs> This, the food in space is pretty good. Um, it's better on Earth, but um, they have a pretty good variety. Uh, there's a food lab here at the Johnson Space Center that makes the American food. And then I also got some European food and I requested some Russian food for my personal stuff. On most days, they have food that it's like a backpack and they call it a bob. So there's like meat and then there's vegetables and then there's fruits and snacks and then there's desserts and drinks and so you have all these different types of containers you open them up and they're and they're usually eight days sometimes they're 14 days and uh, you just go through the whole thing the whole crew um and then when you're done you throw that away and you open up another one and that's how it goes so you have the same menu basically that repeats every eight days which is not bad it's not like on earth i have a unique amazing gourmet meal, three meals a day, you know, it doesn't repeat for months. And so the food was pretty good in space. Um, I loved the turkey tetrazzini was really good. Everybody loves the shrimp cocktail. When you ask astronauts, everybody says that. That was good. I like the chocolate cake. That was really good, but they hardly had any. This one time we opened up a dessert and we found out it was literally the, the, the NASA guys here at Johnson. They threw all the old desserts that nobody wanted into this one dessert, Bob. So Scott Kelly and I ripped through this thing and there was one chocolate brownie. It was a little Debbie brownie. And we, there's a picture of us. I cut it in half and we're both very sad. We're like Brad Pitt and Ad Astra, you know, that was sad Brad. He was very sad for two hours in that movie. So me and Scott mm -hmm. are there like very sad with our half of a little Debbie because that had to last us for eight days. <laughs> but the food was pretty good. And I love the Russian food. The, they, they're really good at meat and potato and soup and fish, especially fish. They're very good at that. Are there any attempts to match astronauts to ensure limited workplace conflict while in flight? And what was your experience with managing different personalities in such a confined space? So, no. Whenever <laughs> crews get together, people are like, well, they must have, you know, I, I like cameras. They must have put you there for the movie. Or you and Samantha and whoever must have really gotten along. The, no, there's, there's no planning. It's just whoever happens to be in that mission at the time each country nominates their own astronaut. So I think there's very little thought that goes into making sure folks get along. Now that said, you know, most astronauts are similar personalities and you know, most of the time it's gonna work out. And for me personally on Expedition 43, when I was the commander, I was really lucky. Like I love all those guys. We're still friends to this day. We still keep in touch. Um, you know, Samantha and I text each other. Gennady and I text each other. Gennady flew on the Around the World, the One More Orbit movie that I made. He joined us and he's like the star. He, he, he's the highlight of the movie, the scenes with him in there. So I really lucked out. My crewmates on Expedition 43 were great. I, I really had a good time with them, but there's no planning. I, I don't know. I was, I don't know how they assigned me, but I, I, I know that there was no planning. <laughs> um, this is a question for both of you. What <coughs> other 
books would you recommend for reading um, both on the space program? It could be astronaut or non-astronaut centric or just general science reading that you would recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mack's book is actually one of our Powell's picks of the holiday season at Powell's. Too. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's. Oh, yeah, there's there you go. Book. Yeah. Well, you know what book I love, Katie? You might, you probably love it too, is The Right Stuff. Mm -hmm. I haven't read it actually. Oh my God. You, I you saw the movie years and you years, years ago. I, well, yeah. Um, I read mostly science fiction. I feel, I feel like that's a, uh, that's a good preparation. I read a lot about fictional spaceships. <laughs> right. Um, I've done events with John Scalzi and uh, a few other science fiction authors that are real. They're really great. Yeah. They're um, great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nouvel was a guy that a uh, French guy lives in Canada. So um, what, what's your favorite science fiction book then, author? Oh, uh, I mean, I, there are so many. Um, uh, I, I really like um, uh, Left Hand of Darkness is one of my favorites, all time favorites. Um, there's, uh, I don't know, the, the Mars series by Kim Stanley Robinson, Red Mars, Green Mars, mm -hmm. Blue Mars. Yeah. Um, those were those were great. I read those a long time ago. Um, recently, I I really like um, I really like Anne Leckie's books, uh, Martha Wells, um, uh, more recent stuff by Kim Stanley Robinson, Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson. I probably told you you have to read that. I don't know if you've done it yet, but I haven't. I tell I've everybody been, they have to. I've read been reading Aurora. all these books for these book tours. Yeah. Events. Yeah, um, I like John Scalzi's stuff, Mary Robinette Kowal. Um, yeah. I don't know. If, yeah, she wrote some I did an event with her. Stuff. Okay, yeah, her, her, her. her Lady Astronaut series is awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, N.K. Jemison. Um, I mean, I could, I could keep going. I probably keep going. shouldn't, but um, my, yeah, there's, my there's so much science great fiction book fiction. Is Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur Clarke. I read, yeah, yeah, I read that recently because of your recommendation. Actually. Yeah, I read it. Yeah, I read it as a kid, and then I just read it a couple of years ago, um, yeah. again. Um, uh, Chuck Wendig is awesome, and oh Silvan yeah, Nouveau Wanderers was so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wanderers is amazing. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot of good books. I've been reading mostly um, nonfiction, which are kind of boring, but I've, I've been reading books about how to write. By the way, Stephen King, if you want to write. A, a book, mm. especially a fiction book. Stephen King has a book called um, On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft. It, he wrote it about 20 years ago and a f buddy of mine recommended it. It's the best book. It's so good mm. about how to write. Mm. And then there's, there's two books called Story and Your Screenplay Sucks that are about <laughs> writing a screenplay. So I've been, I'm really interested in that now. So I've been reading this. I should also mention, um, uh, uh, James S. A. Corey, um, the Expanse novels. Those are oh, really yeah. good. The, the the TV show is amazing, and um, right, yeah. Also, the I've heard it's good, good, but I haven't. I've been watching Breaking Bad, so I ha I'm I'm a little bit behind. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have time for just one more um, question, and it's an easy one. Could you tell us uh, what you're working on next? What what else you're writing, or or what we can see you next? Well, f for me, I'm going to write a kid's book and it's going to be similar to How to Astronaut. It's going to be, you know, ask an astronaut questions. Um, and I want to write it for probably third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade kind of age. Um, I, I got inspired to be an astronaut by reading a book when I was a kid. And so I want to do something like that. That's, mm -hmm. that's my next one. I, was, I went to Colorado last week and was, was writing all week. Cool. Um, for me, uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, I, I wrote a book, <laughs> ending the universe. I don't know how you. I don't know how you follow that. So, uh, I will. I will have to think about that for a while. But um, mostly, I'm. I'm going to be. Uh, I'm going to be writing two research proposals <laughs> in the next couple of months, <laughs> um, and uh, and trying to get uh, back into and hopefully a few papers as well about um, new dark matter research. So. Stay tuned for that, I suppose. <laughs> the that's, the, the life know. of a scientist. I mean, yeah, I've got to, you know, I've got to get back to focusing a little bit more on on the academic side for a bit. So, you know, sort of going back and forth. But that's where I'm at. Excellent. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to host both of you. Uh, 
Dr. Mack's book is The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, and Colonel Vert's book is How to Astronaut, Everything You Need to Know Before Leaving Earth. Both are available about at powells.com. It was a pleasure to host you both. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this was great. This was really fun. It was really good. Yes. Wish it was in person. Exactly. Yeah. And hopefully next time. Next hopefully time. Hopefully yeah. soon. <laughs> Have a good night. Okay. See Thank you guys. You. Bye. Bye-bye.